I have the pleasure then to declare that the uh, meeting is open and we will start with the first presentation, the Barker hypothesis. Unfortunately, Dr. Barker is not with us, but we have the pleasure to have Professor Alan Jackson, his colleague and, and uh, an eminent scientist. Dr. Alan Jackson is director of the Institute of Human Nutrition at the University of Southampton, whose work contributed significantly to structure the care of severely malnourished children, and who also worked uh, uh, on, uh, and, and his work has helped to demonstrate how poor nutrition during fetal and early life sets the risk for chronic adult diseases. I have the pleasure to introduce Professor Alan Jackson. Distinguished colleagues, friends, really is a great pleasure for me to be here and I'm only sorry to disappoint you that I am not David Barker. We do have some things in common. We're both a little short and a little round. And we've both spent many years at the University of Southampton. David sends his most profound apologies that he can't be here and wishes you all well um, in, in the meeting. And so what I am going to try to do, I can't aspire to be David Barker or emulate him, but what I will try to do is to give you a perspective on David's work from my position. And I want to start off with a clear sense of what the objective of our deliberations are, and that's the consideration as to what people die of and what they die of in relationship to nutrition. And the simplest way of capturing that is to look at the mortality related to body mass index during adult life. And this uh, collaborative analysis of 57 prospective studies, nearly a million people, shows shows quite clearly a, a strong U-shaped relationship for both men and women, where the lowest mortality during adult life is for a body mass index between 22 and 25, and mortality increases if body mass index is greater than that and if body mass index is less than that. And the reasons for those are different in terms of men and women. The increase in mortality associated with an increased body mass index is predominantly related to vascular conditions and at the other end, uh, low body mass index predominantly related to respiratory uh, conditions. And both of those can be strongly associated with the size of a baby at birth. And so whereas a few years ago the perspective on chronic disease was that current exposures in terms of the style of life, the diet you ate, whether or not you were overweight, your level of physical activity and whether you smoked or took other substances, current exposures had the primary role in determining the outcome in terms of heart disease, diabetes and cancer. And increasingly, as everybody got interested in the genome, the opportunity for genes to set that risk has been the predominant paradigm. What David Barker has done is to say, well, here are a series of children born on the same day in the University of Southampton uh, Medical School. And these children vary by the size, their length, their weight, their body proportions. And it is possible by knowing something about the size of the baby to indicate the risk of that child's health during adult life. And that's really quite a substantial shift in thought processes. And I'd just like to walk you through some of the background reasons as to why he came to such an alarming and some say it would consider heretical conclusion. And so the fetal origins hypothesis of chronic disease, the Barker hypothesis, the developmental origins of, high, uh, of chronic disease addresses primarily uh, conditions such as coronary heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, and hypertension. David is a cardiovascular physician, and those are the things that come under his clinical practice. And the question is, how do we develop, a de how do we construct a developmental model for these disorders? Well, the story started with a series of maps. David was, is, was director of the uh, the Epidemiology Center in Southampton, the Medical Research Center, uh, uh, Council Center for Research. 
And this map simply uh, plots the relationship in terms of infant mortality rates uh, during the first 10 years of the last century. And it distinguishes those where there was a high, medium, or low infant mortality rate, with the light areas being a low mortality and the dark areas being a high mortality. At the same time, you could draw a diagram and map of the standardized mortality ratios for coronary heart disease among men who were aged 35 to 74, some 50 or 60 years later. And again, you can see the dark areas where there were high mortalities, the gray where there were medium mortalities, and the clear where there were low mortalities. And you can see that if you superimpose one of these maps on the other, then the patterning of dark, medium, and light is very similar for the two maps. And you can, in fact, plot that relationship to look at the geographical distribution of neonatal deaths in relationship to heart disease. So along the x-axis is infant mortality, and on the y-axis is the standardized mortality rate from heart disease. And you see a strong and close relationship. In those days, the usual cause of neonatal death was low birth weight, and the highest death rates during adult, for adults were in the poor areas, industrial towns, and rural areas in the north and west of England. And so this association, why should that geographical relationship between infant mortality and death from heart disease 60 years later, why might that be? And David came and asked the question, are there any nutritional reasons that could explain this relationship? And that is where the journey started. The next major step was for, to go and hunt for birth records that gave us a sense of the, 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 the birth experience of children in the UK. And David came across a unique set of records in one county, Hertfordshire, where the midwives in the early part of the 20th century had kept excellent records of size at birth, feeding pattern, and size at one year of age. And so it was possible to follow these individuals and see what they subsequently died of. And this plot shows you the relationship between birth weight for men and women, with low birth weight on the left and high birth weight on the right, and the standardized mortality rate for coronary heart disease. And you can see that for both genders, there is a graded relationship where those who are born small had a much greater risk of dying of heart disease than those who were born taller, a lot larger, something like a twofold risk across the range. Importantly, this variable risk was across a complete range of birth weight. It was stronger even than this at one year of age, but it isn't a feature simply of the extremes of very low or very high birth weights. It is across the range. And therefore, that means that the factors that contribute to normal variability are related to the risk of heart disease. And so this isn't a phenomenon for those who are extreme in, this, in the population. This is true across the whole range of normal people, you and I. And the question is, why might that be so? It's not unique to the United Kingdom. These are the first data from uh, America, San Antonio Heart Survey, which showed that if you take non-Hispanic or uh, Mexican-Americans, then in terms of insulin resistance, there is a strong relationship in terms of thirds of birth weight, so that those who are born lighter have a much greater risk of insulin resistance syndrome when they grow up than those who are born heavier. It is different amongst the two population groups, but the pattern is the same. Moreover, if you take the total population, then you can relate what happens during uh, early life in terms of birth weight with what happens during adulthood in terms of in terms of body mass index during adults. And you can see that for an infant in the lowest birth weight tertile, those who are increasingly heavy as adults have an increasing risk of insulin resistance syndrome. And the worst situation is to be born light and end up in the top third of body mass index as an adult, and the best situation is to be born heavy and remain in the lowest BMI uh, tertile during an adult. And there are enormous differences between those. And importantly, if you were to do stress tests in children, you can already identify metabolic changes 
the risk factors that underlie uh, these, these disease patterns at very early ages in childhood by five years of age. And so size at birth can be related to a range of outcomes, heart disease, obesity, diabetes, bone health, mental health, cancers, related to the journey through life. And the question is, what is it about the journey through life that either sets or exposes this risk? And so the fetal origins hypothesis of chronic disease recognizes that disorders of uh, adulthood originate during early development through what is called developmental plasticity. The developing organism has options in terms of the way it will grow and develop, and the nutrient environment that it sees will determine which of those options it will take. Importantly, poor nutrient exposure during early life, either as a fetus or an infant or during early childhood, sets in place changes in structure and function because that is when the tissues and organs are developing, acquiring their shape and size, acquiring their functionality. And therefore the vulnerability of the nutrient exposure depends upon the timing, which particular organism, organ is developing at the time of the challenge, how strong the challenge is, the intensity, and how long it lasts. And that underlies the risk of later disease. In order to explore this pattern of growth that relates to this, David had the opportunity to work with colleagues in Finland where they collect growth data for children as a matter of course from very early in life at regular intervals up to adulthood. And so it is possible to take individuals in that population who develop disease and see what their patterns of growth were like from very early in life. And so this slide shows the pattern of growth for boys and girls who as adults ended up having coronary heart disease. It shows a growth from birth up to 11 years of age, and it's plotted as Z scores, Z scores for height, Z scores for weight and body mass index. And in these plots, the mean, the, the, the zero Z score, is the mean for that population. So these are within population comparisons. And what you can see that within that population, those who went on to get heart disease as adults, for boys, they were born relatively short, minus one Z score. They were even less in weight. Their weight was minus two, uh, 0.2 Z scores, so they had a low body mass index. And they, that continued until they were two years of age. So at two years of age, they're still short and thin. But between two years of age and 11 years of age, their pattern of growth changes so that they don't grow particularly well in height, any faster in height, but they do gain weight faster. And so that by 11 years of age, they are short and fatter than you would expect uh, compared to the rest of the population. Yeah.